we've now dismissed, you know, the traditional thoughts in the keto world about what ketones do. But let's talk about the uncoupling and why they serve this other purpose that's actually very profound. Yeah, um, and probably as a lead into that, there are actually multiple studies uh, looking at a low-carb ketogenic diet versus a normal-carb diet or even a a high-carb diet for weight loss. And also, many of these studies look at metabolic rates in the subject individuals. And there have been multiple ones, but the long story short is that if you look at these diets over six months to a year, there's actually almost no difference between a low-carb ketogenic diet and a normal carb diet on a weight loss regimen. Very little, and I show many documentations. But in these studies, there's little kind of cute pearls that bear our attention. And that is, if you look at like three weeks into the diet, four weeks into the diet, there's actually no difference in metabolic rates between the ketogenic diet and the high-carb diet. Everybody's kind of burning the same calories. But if you follow these studies out, and most studies don't go much farther than a month or so, uh, if you follow these studies out, after that point, the ketogenic diet, the low-carb diet, they begin to increase their metabolic rate and above the high-carbohydrate diet. And you go, well, that's interesting. Why on a ketogenic diet, and if ketones are a star, protect yourself from starving me- uh, mechanism, why in the world would your metabolic rate increase? Why would you burn more calories than the carbohydrate diet. That doesn't make sense. And that was what I and pretty much all the keto experts kept saying is, you're going to be an efficient fat burner. Why? And yes, your metabolic rate uh, might go down because you're an efficient fat burner, but in fact, your metabolic rate goes up. So, There was a fascinating paper that anyone interested in the ketogenic diet really ought to read. It's an easy paper to read. Um, It's written by uh, a PhD by the name of Dr. Martin Brand, and it was written in the year 2000, so fairly recent. And the paper is called Uncoupling to Survive. And what he said is that in extremis, if you're starving to death, if the organism has nothing to eat, then mitochondria uh, have to protect themselves at all costs. Because if the mitochondria dies, then who cares about the muscles? Who cares about anything? Because the mitochondria is what generates the energy. And so he proposed that mitochondria actually ought to as paradoxic as it sounds, waste energy and throw a lot of the calories that they would normally use to produce ATP outside exits, emergency exits in the electron transport chain so that they protect themselves. Now, it turns out that making ATP is dirty business. It's hard work. It generates a lot of damage to the mitochondria. And most people have heard of reactive oxygen species, ROSs, free radicals. These, and I I have a fun time with it, with uh, the analogy of the mito club um, to describe how ATP is made. And literally what you want to do is you want to couple a proton with an oxygen molecule and generate ATP. And it's literally called coupling. You want to put a proton and an oxygen oxygen together and bind them. The product is water and ATP and carbon dioxide. So that's coupling to produce energy. But it turns out that that's damaging to mitochondria. So there ought to be a method to literally pop off all the 
extra, all the extra pressure to make ATP. Very much like a pressure cooker, once it gets to a very high pressure, has a pop-off valve, and you hear the steam coming out. If it didn't have that pop-off valve, you'd blow up the pressure cooker like my mother did when I was growing up. Very exciting. Um, all over the ceiling. So we, we have to have pop-off valves. And these pop-off valves are controlled. There's five of them in every mitochondria, and they're called uncoupling proteins. And I didn't make up the word uncoupling. I wouldn't have used that word, but sorry, it's that's what it's called. So they throw out protons through these emergency exits or a pop-off valve of a pressure cooker to prevent damage to the mitochondria. Now, here's the amazing thing. At rest, 30% of all the calories we eat are uncoupled from making ATP. At rest. Uh, now, if you think about it, what a dumb design for an organism. You've got to literally eat 30% more calories every day to generate the amount of ATP to stay alive. So you go, what a weird design. Why, you know, why would a biologic system have this design? Well, the answer is uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, blowing off those extra calories generates heat. And we're a warm-blooded animal. And it turns out cold-blooded animals actually are relatively warm-blooded, warm uh, just less than us. So all animals use this uncoupling to generate heat. Most of us have heard of brown fat. Uh, brown fat is so loaded with mitochondria, so stuffed with mitochondria, that it literally looks brown under the microscope. In contrast, white fat has very little mitochondria. In between, as I talk about a lot, is beige fat. And you can actually turn white fat into beige fat by, believe it or not, uncoupling mitochondria. So brown fat burns huge amounts of calories that doesn't turn into ATP. And that's why they keep, for instance, a baby warm uh, when the baby's really not eating very much. And so uncoupling mitochondria is built into our system. Getting back to your original question, why in the world, when we're starving to death, would we even throw more of these calories away? The answer is that not only do we want to protect the mitochondria from damage, and the less work they have to do, the less damage they do, but at the same time, this system of starvation tells mitochondria to make more of themselves, and it's called mitogenesis. Why? Well, I like to use the example of a dog sled, and I should have used it in the book. I thought about it later. Uh, if you've got one dog pulling your dog sled, the dog's not going to eat very much, but he's going to do a lot of work to pull that sled. If we hook six dogs to the sled, each dog literally has to do a sixth of the work of a single dog, but they're going to eat a whole lot more than that single dog. So what we do is each dog, each mitochondria, has far less individual work to do, which protects them from damage. But each mitochondria is going to use more energy. So the net effect is we can produce the same amount of ATP with a lot more mitochondria, and each mitochondria is wasting fuel. And therein lies the amazing factor of why your metabolic rate goes up if you're in ketosis. Because, surprise, surprise, ketones actually are signaling molecules that tell mitochondria to do this. So as Dr. Brand said, uncoupling to survive looked in that content makes a huge amount of sense. And everybody says, ah, now wait a minute, that's just nuts. Why would we do that? And he says, well, I'll tell you what. Let's look at super old people who are thriving at 105 years old and let's look at how uncoupled their mitochondria are. 
And lo and behold, super old people who are thriving have the most uncoupled mitochondria of any individuals. And you go, wow, Brand was right. You know, it's that's just one thing that can make you really thrive is uncoupling your mitochondria. And so what you share in the book, and we're going to get into throughout the conversation, is how to enhance that uncoupling. And right. you talked about a couple of the benefits of uncoupling, one being the mitogenesis, so we're making more mitochondria, two being the wasted energy, so we, which will lead to weight loss. And the third one you talk about in the book is the fact that this allows the mitochondria to repair as well. Correct. So that's the third part. The, the mitochondria, again, making energy is damaging. And so mitochondria need to undergo repair. Now, one of the kind of revelations of the book is that there are actually only two uh, mitochondrial antioxidants. Everybody thinks, oh, gee, you know, you need antioxidants in your mitochondria to work on reactive oxygen species and free radicals, which is true. But it turns out you could swallow all the vitamin C in the world, all the vitamin E in the world, and it not only doesn't get to the mitochondria, but could actually have some bad implications. So there's only two. One is melatonin. And I spent a lot of time talking about how we've gotten melatonin all wrong. It is not a sleep hormone. It is a hormone that actually comes out during sleep for the purpose of repairing mitochondria. So association does not necessarily mean causation. The other is glutathione, and glutathione can be reconstituted by vitamin C. This is true, but glutathione and melatonin are the only two uh, mitochondrial antioxidants. And I talk about that, you know, a car has a service interval that we're, you know, the, we even have sensors on our modern cars that look at how hard the car is working, what conditions the car is running in, and it says, you know, it flashes on your dashboard, you know, check engine or time for oil change, etc. Well, we have a service interval, and our service interval is 24 hours, and that's our circadian rhythm. And the reason we have that service interval, and the reason we know that sleep deprivation is one of the most awful things that can happen to us, is mitochondria during sleep have to go under, under repair cycle. They have to clean up their act. And they don't have to produce much energy during sleep. So they use that time to repair themselves. And it turns out that that signal to repair themselves actually comes from melatonin and melatonin production but it also comes from ketones. And ketones signal mitochondria, like we just said, to waste energy, don't hurt your cells very much, make more of your cells, mitogenesis, and actively repair your cells. So those three factors are actually kind of the, the miracle of what ketones do. Uh, as I talk about in the book, um, most people probably don't know. But if we have metabolic flexibility, that is the ability to change on a dime in our mitochondria from using glucose to using free fatty acids and or ketones as a fuel. And it the minute glucose runs out, you should be using free fatty acids and, and ketones. And very much like a hybrid hybrid car. When when you're running on gas, you're charging the battery. And let's just call the battery our fat store. When we run out of gas, we should immediately be able to draw on our battery and you know power the wheels that way. Uh, really sad news is that normal weight people. Normal weight people, only 50% of us are metabolically flexible, able to change. Overweight people, 88% of overweight people are metabolically inflexible. They can't make the shift. 
99.5% of obese people, and that's now approaching 50% of Americans, cannot make the switch between burning glucose and fat as a fuel. So when we sleep, when we stop eating, it takes about eight hours in a normal person, and most of us aren't normal anymore, to begin generating ketones. By 12 hours, uh, normally, we should ramp up keep ketone production to a pretty good clip. So at 12 hours, 8 to 12 hours after we eat, we should start getting signaling from ketones to uh, uncouple mitochondria, to repair themselves, and to build more mitochondria. The problem is almost nobody actually gets that signal anymore. And I go into why night workers, it's, it's an unmitigated disaster because of this. So um, if you'll allow me to continue with that thought process, or we'll take a break, um, I think one of the most dramatic studies that I talk about in, in the book is the implication from uh, calorie-restricted animal studies and then Italian athletes. Uh, there's a researcher at the NIH, Dr. Rafael de Cabo, who was very intrigued about why calorie restriction seems to be the only proven way to extend lifespan in almost every animal uh, study. And this was proven in one set of rhesus monkeys at the University of Wisconsin, but the researchers at the NIH couldn't find the same results. And de Cabo said, and it was actually brilliant, he said, you know, I don't think it's the lack of calories that was actually what was happening to these animals. When we study animals, we control when we give them food. And when you're calorie restricted, most of these studies, you put the food out at one particular time during the day. And if you're eating 30% cal less calories per day, you're really hungry. So when that food gets put out, you're going to eat it very quickly. And it's going to be gone. And so you're going to be fasting a lot longer until the food arrives the next day than someone who just gets to munch all day. So he designed some very elegant experiments using, using rats. Um, and he basically wanted to show that it was the amount of time the animals were not eating that made the difference in their health, in their lifespan, in their metabolic flexibility, and even in their cancer and Alzheimer's rates. And so what he did was control the time of food that was put out and compared it to animals that got to eat all day long and all night long. Uh, rats eat mostly at night. And he found that if he controlled when the full portion of food was put out, to, a, to three o'clock in the afternoon, the rats would eat their food actually quite rapidly and they would be fasting for a great period of the 24 hours. On the other hand, if he just had food available for the rats 24 hours a day, they'd kind of munch all day long. He found that these animals who were time restricted to their eating, time restricted eating, time controlled eating, intermittent fasting, lived about 11% longer than the rats who had all-day food. Now, that doesn't sound like much for, for, for a human being. That's 10 years of great life. And he showed that those animals who ate the same amount of food as the other rats were metabolically flexible. They could change between using fat and glucose, whereas the rats that ate all day long had no metabolic flexibility. And the rats who had time-controlled eating had no amyloid production, and they actually had far less cancer when they eventually did die. So that's, that's pretty remarkable. Maybe it's not the fact that you're controlling calories, it's the fact that you're controlling time. So now, one of the most amazing studies uses Italian athletes, Italian cyclists, and they put them on a training table for three months. And most people know what a training table is. They had to eat the exact same food. What they changed was the time that these athletes got to eat their food. So one group had breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning. They had lunch at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and they had to finish dinner at 8 o'clock at night. 
a 12-hour eating window. The other group had break fast at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, lunch at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and dinner had to be finished at 8 o'clock, a 7-hour eating window. Same food, same athletic uh, production. At the end of the study, the athletes who ate in a seven-hour window lost weight. The athletes who ate in a 12-hour window had no weight loss. But perhaps most dramatically is that the athletes in the seven-hour window plummeted their insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1. And people have heard me talk and write that if, if you had one marker to look at your possibility of longevity, it's IGF-1. Lower IGF-1, basically the longer you live and the longer you live well, the less cancer you have. The higher your IGF-1, more cancer, shorter lifespan. These guys plummeted their IGF-1. The 12-hour window didn't. So why in the world with the same food did the seven-hour window guys lose weight? All right, let's go back to ketones. So we start doing ketones at about eight hours after stopping eating. 12 hours, we've really started to ramp up. So the 12-hour guys, they're just kind of getting the benefit of ketones, but then they eat. The other guys, they go another five hours of ketone production before they eat. And ketones uncouple their mitochondria for five hours longer than the other guys. So they waste fuel five hours more than the other guys. They repair their mitochondria for five hours more, and they build more mitochondria for five hours more. And so they lose weight. They literally do a caloric bypass using the same amount of calories. And that explains why these studies of ketogenic diets, that the basal metabolic rate goes up on a ketogenic diet if you do it right, uh, because you're literally wasting more fuel. You're burning more calories, but not producing uh, ATP. I love how you tied that all together. So the highlights we want to gain from that are the fact that we want to restrict our eating window produce more ketones throughout the day. And then that's going to be the uncoupling signal, which is going to allow all those benefits we talked about before, including weight loss, wasting energy. Yeah. I mean, it's as strange as it may seem, I and others, um, you know, talked about uh, improving mitochondrial efficiency and that's why you lost weight. In fact, if we were an efficient fat burner, then Fat has uh, nine calories per gram versus carbohydrates or protein, which have four calories per gram. So if we were efficiently burning uh, fat, we actually ought to gain weight uh, because we're efficient. We, we're a Toyota Prius. As I, uh, you know, that's an efficient vehicle. That, if I wanted to be efficient gas burner, I'd get a Prius. On the other hand, if I wanted to waste gasoline, I'd get a Ferrari because Man, you know, that really wastes gasoline. Now, there's other reasons I might want a Ferrari, but if I wanted to waste gasoline, if I wanted to become an inefficient fat burner, gas burner, I'd turn into a Ferrari. And quite frankly, the evidence is we want our mitochondria to become Ferraris. And I kind of like my mitochondria as Ferraris because I'll never have one. <laughs> So we know now the goal here is to uncouple and you get all these different health benefits. So let's look at it from a different angle. We know now fasting, it's going to produce ketones, it's going to help us uncouple our mitochondria. We can come at it now from a dietary perspective. And you talked about MCT oil earlier, and this can be a real hack for people that are metabolically flexible, that are producing ketones, you know, during a fasted state, they can ramp it up and add those, they can add MCT oil in and get more of an effect. But this also can be a great benefit for people who want to include some carbs or they're early on in the phase here and they're not yet metabolically flexible. So let's come at it from this other angle and talk about how MCT oil can be used as a helpful tool to produce those ketones. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, getting back to these human studies of a low carb ketogenic diet versus 
a regular high carb diet. I mentioned that most of these studies show that there's no increase in metabolic rate on the ketogenic diet in most people for three to four weeks after they start it. And you go, well, wait a minute, you know, they're on a ketogenic diet. If ketones are doing all this great stuff, what's the deal? Well, that gets back to the point that almost everybody is metabolically inflexible. And they have actually very high insulin levels. And they have insulin resistance. And I, I'm sure most of your uh, viewers know insulin resistance by now. And I, if they don't, I talk a lot about it. Insulin is fascinating. Insulin, when we eat, insulin is a fat storage hormone for any extra calories that we don't immediately use as an ATP production. And insulin literally unlocks the door to muscle cells and says, hey, guy just really ate some great stuff. You know, here's, here's what you want. And if there's any extra, insulin unlocks the door to fat cells uh, through an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase and stores the additional calories and fat. So when insulin's elevated and you're trying to store fat, the last thing you want to do is take fat out of storage. That'd be dumb. Every time you put it in, somebody pulls it out. So insulin, when it's elevated, blocks the release of fat from fat storage. And it blocks it by blocking an enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase. Hormone-sensitive. Hmm, what's it sensitive to? The hormone insulin. So when insulin is elevated, you may have lots of fat in your fat stores, but you can't get it out until insulin falls, and then hormone-sensitive lipase is released. And as I've talked about in this book and other books, it's kind of like water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. So most of us have an elevated insulin level, and most of us, even when we start a ketogenic diet, it may take three or four weeks for our insulin levels to drop enough for our free fatty acids to come out of fat stores, then go to the liver, and then make ketones. So it's actually a really long process, which explains Volchik and Veach's work, uh, sorry, and Vogel's work, uh, Finney's work, that it may take three, four weeks to get a benefit in an athletic performance, or at least get back to baseline on a ketogenic diet, because most people can't generate ketones. So the, the point of all that is MCT oil, on the other hand, MCTs, medium chain triglycerides, are unique in that they're absorbed directly from our intestines, unlike any other fats, and they go directly to our liver, where they are converted automatically into ketones. So the beauty of MCT oil is you could have insulin resistance like most human beings and yet still generate ketones if you get MCT oil. And I joke, you could have a fresh fruit salad, please don't, but you could have a fresh fruit salad and wash it down with a tablespoon or two of MCT oil and you would generate ketones, even though you've just eaten, you know, the monster carbohydrate meal of the world, you'd still generate ketones. And the ketones would uncouple mitochondria. So that's one of the great things of unlocking the keto code. There's ways around this until we get to the point of releasing free fatty acids to take over the job. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. When you start looking at what all of these health things do, it all comes down to just one thing.